Uh, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the Surjit Singh Lecture. It's a traditional lecture that focuses on the domain of the interreligious and interfaith. Surjit Singh was a professor emeritus at the San Francisco Theological Seminary and was the dean there at that seminary from 1972 to 1978. He taught at the GTU from the period of 1962 to 1988. And he, so his long time involvement with uh, Graduate Theological Union. He came to this country in 1951. Before that, he was the National Secretary of the Student Christian Association in India and in Burma and Sri Lanka, New Zealand. To introduce our speaker today, um, I will call upon Arthur Holder. Arthur has been fated all spring for having been a truly wonderful and remarkable academic dean of the GTU for 14 years. He will continue as our, I'm glad to say, as our accreditation liaison officer and as a professor of Christian spirituality for at least the next three years. He's well familiar to you, um, and I am pleased to have him come forward and introduce our speaker for today. As President Putterfeld said, the Surjit Singh Lecture is an annual event here at the GTU, one of the highlights of each academic year, and it goes back quite a few years. It goes back actually to a conversation between Professor Surjit Singh and then Dean of the GTU, Judith Burling. So um, it's very appropriate that we are um, having the lecture this year in conjunction with the symposium honoring Judith, we knew that many of the same people would want to be at both events, so let's just have them in the same place um, at, the, at the same time. Our uh, speaker today is no stranger to the GTU and certainly no stranger to Judith Burling. Philip Wickery was on the faculty at the San Francisco Theological Seminary and, and the GTU from 1998 to 2009, where he was the Flora Lamson Hewlett Professor of Evangelism and Mission. He was, during that time, very active in the interdisciplinary studies area and uh, has continued from a distance in his location in Hong Kong, being very involved um, with some students that he began working with here, and I think the two, last two of them just graduated last week or two weeks ago. Um, so uh, Philip has, and his legacy have, has continued. Philip Wickery is advisor to the Archbishop on Theological and Historical Studies in the Anglican Episcopal um, Church of, Hang, of Hong Kong. And he also teaches at Minghua Theological College and serves as honorary chaplain at St. John's Cathedral. Philip received his PhD from Princeton Seminary and has been honored by the Church Divinity School of the Pacific here with the degree of Doctor of Divinity honoris causa in 2005. He is a prolific author, especially on topics related to the history of Christianity in China. His most recent edited volume entitled Christian Encounters with Chinese Culture, Essays on Anglican and Episcopal History in China that was published in 2015. We are delighted to welcome him back physically to the GTU. He's always been a part of this community and look forward to an address that ties together all of these themes toward a more perfect union, the contribution of Judith Burling to religious pluralism in theological education. Professor Wickery. It's good to be here and to see so many familiar faces. 
and also so to see many new faces who are continuing on with all of the things that the GTU has pioneered in over the years, and especially the work of Judith Burley. As uh, Arthur just said, the annual Surjit Singh Lecture on Comparative religi Religious Thought and Culture was designed to foster interreligious and cross-cultural communication, learning, and understanding. It is appropriate that this lecture be at the GTU because this is part of our own ecumenical and interreligious tradition. And it is especially appropriate that the lecture this year is part of this series, this conference on learning as collaborative conversation to celebrate the scholarship and teaching of my friend, Professor Judith Burling. So it's an honor for me to present this annual lecture in this distinguished series. I knew Sarjeet Singh in his uh, retirement and we often had uh, conversations about areas of mutual uh, interest. And I'm, I believe uh, Sarjeet's daughter, whom I also know, uh, Smita Durando, uh, is following us on live stream, but I don't know if that's actually the case. Thank you, Sarjeet. Sarjeet gave the inaugural lecture in this series in 1991 and Professor Judith Burling delivered the singing lecture in 1996. Over the course of 25 years, many distinguished scholars have offered this lecture, and I'm humbled to be in their presence. My title uh, is borrowed from the then Senator Barack Obama's famous speech of 2008, which was in turn the title borrowed from the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> Our Constitution uh, uh, looked uh, for a more perfect union of justice, peace, and liberty. And uh, the Senator Obama drew on this to address issues of race, poverty, health care, and education in a new millennium. To be sure, no union can ever be perfect. And this is as true in the world of theology and religious studies as it is in the social political life of the United States. In this lecture, I want to draw on uh, Judith Burling's intellectual journey to speak on the subject of religious pluralism and theological education. The Graduate Theological Union was formed at the height of the movement of ecumenism in Christian theological education, but little thought was given at the time to the importance of pluralism, interreligious understanding, and other religious traditions for theological education in the preparation for ministry. It is in this area that Judith has made her particular contribution, and in so doing, she was and still is far ahead of her time. So I'm going to begin by saying something about the scholarship of Judith Burling. Uh, not in fear and trembling, even though Judith is right here in front of me, <laughs> but because what she has written, she no longer has control over. So <laughs> I begin with a quote. Over the course of her life, she increasingly identified herself with the other side of the sagely ideal, the teacher of women and men. Her role emulated the style of Confucius, and she expressed in her professional vows her serious commitment to her role as teacher. However, she was not just a teacher of the classics, one who prepared students for examinations. She was also a religious teacher, a converter and savior of women and men, in the educational system. She believed that she was called to revive the true transmission of the way. To her students, she was the sage who forms one body with heaven and earth and all things through her mind of humanity. Now I'm of course referring to Lin Chao'en, the 16th century Chinese thinker who was the subject of Judith Burling's doctoral dissertation in 1976. I've changed the pronouns and made slight changes in the text just quoted, but it's from the concluding pages of Judith Burling's first book, The Syncretistic Religion of Lin Zhao En, published in 1980. Scholars are sometimes drawn to study historical figures whose ideas they themselves embrace, at least in part. And in the case of her study of Lin Zhao En, we see the early budding of ideas Judith would continue to pursue throughout her career. Over the past months, I have been immersed in the writings of Judith Burling. I've taken things with me on my computer. I've read all of her books, uh, some for the first time, some once again. 
And uh, it has been a pleasure to sort of follow this, her development from the beginning up until the present. She wrote in 2006 that it took her 20 years to find her scholarly voice. And if that's so, to read her work chronologically, which I tried to do, uh, helps us to understand the emergence of her voice. She would not want me to summarize her intellectual history, and I could not do so in a short lecture. Instead, I pick up three overlapping themes in her work that especially interest me. And I'm going to pick them up and then interpret them in my own way. And I think this will illuminate the contribution that I speak of and some of the things that many people have already spoken of at this conference. And it will, in this way, facilitate our own collaborative conversation and further exploration. So the first theme is Chinese thought and religion. And this has not been spoken of too much so far, uh, except one of the speakers uh, went a little bit into this. But her study of Chinese thought and China's religious diversity has, I believe, shaped her whole approach to teaching and learning. She began her work at Carleton College and went to Columbia University for graduate study in Chinese culture, history, and religion. At Columbia, she did the requisite language work, continuing her studies in China and Japan, in, in Japan and Taiwan. This should not be glossed over, for language study and cultural immersion and the reading of text takes a lot of time and hard work. It should also be enjoyable, and I think in Judith's case, it was. This was at the height of the area studies interest in American higher education. And among other things that we not, need not go into here, area studies was of necessity multidisciplinary, for all aspects of a nation or a society need to be taken into account to develop a better understanding of a people a culture, or a religion. Judith began her studies by focusing on China on its own terms, by trying to understand China in its own context, concentrating on the people, the thinkers, the religious believers, uh, in the ways that they were trying to understand themselves. Unlike many in area studies, she did not try to instrumentalize China or pose some theoretical construct on her subjects. And this is often a failing of many graduate students, although, of course, none of those who have been speaking so far. <laughs> she was drawn to her study of China by an interest in ecumenism and religion, and was originally intending to go to Union Theological Seminary in New York. Fortunately, she ended up at another union, which he is helping to make more perfect. Um, you can read about this elsewhere, about the her reasons for the change, but her interest shifted to Chinese studies. But theology and religious studies, in combination, have always been on her mind. Her engagement with Chinese culture began, she writes, in a university course that changed her life. And I think many of us here can think about that same kind of transformation in a different ways in our own lives. Judith, who has been a mentor to many of us, faculty as well as students, had two mentors of her own, Bardwell, Bardwell Smith at Carleton and William Theodore DeBerry at Graduate School in Columbia. They introduced her to China and Japan, and like all good mentors, they inspired her, encouraged her, and supported her in many ways, much more than just academic. We all know that mentors often believe in us more than we do in ourselves. Judith's own involvement in, with China goes far beyond the academic. I know this from personal experience because of her interest in Chinese art and literature and archaeology and travel and, of course, food. <laughs> Especially dim sum, I, I heard <laughs> earlier today. Judith was never an Orientalist in Edward Said's redefinition of the term. And here, I want to just insert something from one of my own teachers, Frederick W. Moat, uh, a China historian who was trained in traditional Chinese methods, um, who said, who, who just, I just read this a few days ago, that Said's thesis, uh, as applied to the East Asian experience with the West, uh, really has very little evidence behind it, as far as North American and European Sinologists have been concerned. 
from the time of the Jesuits in the 17th century and onward. In any case, Judith's perspective on China has always, uh, on China has always been uh, sensitive and appreciative. And she has always been involved with people as the subjects of their own history and culture. Religious ideas and cultural concepts matter to her because they related to people and communities. Relationships have been important for her more than any form of study, and she has had no interest in changing China or trying to impose a vision upon it. Her first, and in some ways most academic book, is on uh, Song and post-Song religion in China. This is the Song dynasty from the 10th to the 13th century and focusing on the syncretism of Lin Chao En. But even here, she had, a more, she had a broader and more general interest in mind than simply publishing and reworking her doctoral dissertation. She was writing for non-specialists. The idea of syncretism in China has never had the problematic connotations that it has had in the West, especially among the Abrahamic traditions. In China, it's more common to speak of religious traditions in relationship with one another, and to see this as promoting tolerance and mutual understanding. Syncretism for Burling, this is the early Burling, remember, uh, is borrowing uh, affirmation or integration of concepts, symbols, or practices of one religious tradition into another by a process of selection and reconciliation. Somewhat like Judith herself, Lin Zhao An did not aspire to advance a new system of religious thought or a creative new approach to Confucianism. Rather, he sought to be a teacher deeply committed to religion and spirituality for himself and for his students. Fast forward 20 years, um, and uh, Judith's uh, second book, A Pilgrim in Chinese Culture, came out. In this book, she writes about what she has learned from a Chinese understanding of the religious journey to expand her own religious and theological pilgrimage. She was an outsider and an other in Chinese culture, and because of this, she learned humility about her own uh, really, uh, understanding, and especially her understanding of that culture. This, in turn, broadened her horizon uh, through her learning from, from and not just about China. She repeatedly writes that this pilgrimage was a journey to deeper spirituality in her own context. In addition, it helped her to facilitate interreligious communication and negotiate religious diversity. But I would argue, this could never have happened had, she not, had it not begun with an understanding of Chinese religious life on its own terms. Her use of concrete stories more than abstract concepts has helped us to journey with her. I was, a few days ago, I listened to M. Scott Mamaday. I don't know if any of you know him, and he's a national treasure now in his 80s, and uh, telling his stories just off the cuff. And it was just a marvelous experience to show the way in which narrative helps to shape our understanding and, and pushes us deeper into, or wanting to go deeper into an understanding of a culture, in his case, Native American. Uh, so Judith did this, but she also introduces new ideas. I especially like her use of the Chinese character Jing as a heuristic device to contextualize Chinese uh, religious interactions. It's appears, the character appears in the book on the cover. Think of a tic-tac-toe for a cross. I mean, that's what the character looks like. The pictograph may also describe the well-filled system in rice-growing China. Judith uses this character to describe religious borrowing from around a common core. She then develops her own model of Chinese religious life and religious diversity, going beyond what she did with Lin Chao En. She emphasizes the cultural embeddedness of all religions and writes about interreligious negotiating, assimilating, appropriating, and resisting uh, uh, in Chinese religious encounters and in her own. The book is a good introduction to Chinese religious life for a non-specialized audience recognizing the different local, regional, and national variations, as well as the ways in which religion, uh, mediate, religions mediate political power, provide access to the transcendent, and develop multi-layered embodiment of the way, Dao in Chinese. More than simply a book about Chinese religion, 
A pilgrim in Chinese culture is a study of what Chinese religious understanding can contribute to a revised Christian perspective on our own religious neighbors in North America. But it begins with developing an understanding of other religions in that encounter. Now, it wouldn't be good for me simply to be here and to give my interpretation of Judith, but I have to show how it's recreated in some of my own work. And so I now have an excursus. <laughs> Judith, we're going to Fujian together. Uh, this, this, this is uh, the, us, in, us in Hong Kong a few years ago. Okay. Um, think about that, 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 that photo. Uh, Fujian is the most interesting province religiously in China for the study of religions of all kinds, folk religion, Buddhism, Taoism, as well as Roman Catholicism and Protestant Christianity. Islam is also represented here, but not as significantly as in other parts of China. I think we can say that Fujian is the most religious province of China, and I think I have some reasons of uh, sort of uh, why, why I can say this whether judged in terms of the number of adherents or public visibility. I visited Mawe, the coastal port of Fuzhou, which has historically been an important center for trade and shipbuilding. Fuzhou was one of the first treaty ports uh, in China after the first Opium War, 1842, and Mawe is on the coast, so the goods were brought into Fuzhou and then put into smaller boats and shipped up, uh, up to, to Fuzhou. Uh, and along with the traders, of course, came the missionaries. In the process, the small town of Maui became a bustling entrepot of Chinese shipping magnates, sailors, traders, naval officers, foreign missionaries, and military men alongside the local population. It's not very far from Putian, which was the birthplace of Lin Zhao En, and, uh, and Putian itself later became a center of Chinese Anglicanism, which I'm working on. In Maui, I was taken to the Mazu Temple, to this temple. Uh, Mazu, as many of you know, is the heavenly empress. That's what the characters there say, Tian Ho, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Chinese, who protects sailors and seafarers. She's widely worshipped in the coastal religions of China, especially in Zhejiang, Fujian, Guangzhou, and uh, Taiwan, and elsewhere, as well as in Southeast Asia, and also in California. She was born uh, Lin Monyang, and Lin Monyang means the silent lady, which I think is a, this is the, the name she was given after her death, in the year 960 and died in 987. 600, 600 years later, Lin Zhao En would have been familiar with the worship of Mazu, including the temple for her, a very grand one in his hometown. According to legend, Lin, Lin Monyang, who lived in Meizhou Island off the coast of Fuzhou, uh, wore red garments while standing on the shore to guide uh, the fishing boats home, even in the most dangerous and harsh weather. Her life was shortened in the service of others. Um, one day, when her father and brothers were drowning in a typhoon, Lim Monyang went into a trance to save her father and brothers. She succumbed to an early death after this heroic act. Her spirit continues to protect seafarers and attract a popular uh, and attract uh, 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 and attract a popular cult, which has now spread far beyond. Her birthday festival during the third month of the Chinese Lunar New Year attracts tens of thousands of pilgrims across Taiwan in a 90-mile procession, which has become an annual and multi-million dollar media extravaganza, as well as a much contested political arena on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. As Judith notes in her book, Chinese religions are naturally syncretistic, and so Mazu has been appropriated by Buddhists and Taoists in attempts to attract devotees. Some Buddhists believe that Mazu is an incarnation of the goddess of mercy, Guan Yin. Uh, in Fujian, there's a Mazu association today that emphasizes the humanistic and ethical characteristic of, of, of Mazu. In Macau, uh, Mazu is considered the founding patron of the city. Uh, so th the study of pilgrimages, as, as some have done, of feminism and religion, of spirituality, all of this is sort of, can be sort of approached through a study of Mazu. Now, Fujian, uh, this is a kind of sideline here, has always been the center of Chinese Anglicanism. 
And by 1938, almost half of Anglicans, Anglican Christians, were from this province. And I'm just saying this because this is what I'm working on, and that's what brought me to Fujian in the first place. More Chinese Anglican bishops came from Fujian than from any other place. Uh, I, I, whereas, uh, I learned, uh, Mark, that, uh, that uh, Archbishop Paul's mother is from this same place. So there, there's something about producing bishops in, 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 in Fujian province. Although Western denominations no longer exist in mainland China, there's an increasing interest in their study in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, I went to Mazu Temple escorted by a young man who's very much attracted to Anglican traditions of theology and worship. He attends the former Christ Cathedral in Fuzhou, which is the largest by far of any present or former Anglican cathedral in China. Uh, but he lives in Ma Wei, where his family has been for five generations. The young man who is my guide is very much fond of this temple, uh, and, um, which is a center of cultural and religious life of the city. It looks out over the port, although the view of the sea is being obscured by the many new buildings. There's, there's uh, Mazu. The Mazu Temple dates from 1868, and it's been restored several times over the last 50 years. The interesting thing about this temple, and I've visited many, many Mazu temples, is that it not only features Mazu, but two other local female deities as well. Uh, all the imagery in the temple is, uh, is feminine, and we may say that it's a women's temple, both in its iconography and its construction. My guide emphasized that it was primarily the wives and the daughters of the seafarers who used to go to the temple to pray for their husbands and sons who were at sea. As usual, it's the women who were helping the men, and the men didn't even realize it. The temple increasingly assumed this feminine character, which is unusual for the Mazu temples I've seen. Now, I asked my friend how he related this to his own Christian belief, and he said the temple is part of our cultural tra and tradition and I embrace it as such. A good enough answer, I think. He had said earlier that the Anglican theology helped him accept and not negate Chinese culture, and this was different in perspective from some of the evangelical traditions in China. I spoke to him about T.C. Zhao, Zhao Zichen, the outstanding Chinese theologian of the 20th century who himself became an Anglican in order to embrace religion and culture in his theological work. We were too rushed to go very deeply into the, this discussion, but I was reminded about Judith's own work on pilgrimage. My guide, just as T.C. Zhao before him, was on a pilgrimage. And not everything on a pilgrimage can be easily explained, as all of you, you know. Mazu is worth further study. Her relationship to the shalers at sea and to the state power and patronage, her appropriation of other, by other Chinese religions, the uniqueness of a women's temple, in, uh, uh, in, in Fujian. Uh, uh, Mazu can also be studied through an interreligious approach involving Christianity. How should Christians understand and learn from this kind of devotion? Devotion to Mazu, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to Guanyin, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the importance of representation of religious women, Judith's commitment to Chinese studies, feminist studies, and theology helps us to make a connection and suggest possible approaches. At least that's what I thought on this journey to Fujian. That's the old port. Thank you for that. Okay. Let's go, let's have another picture. On this. Well, let's look at the old port for a while. <laughs> so this is the first of the areas of, 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 her, of her study. The second one is interreligious learning and Christianity, um, which has, uh, the GTU has uh, uh, pioneered too in this area in theological education. Um, but it's primarily been a consortium of Christian theological seminaries and divinity schools, although this is now changing. Judith, herself a committed Episcopalian, has taken the Christian context of her, as her starting point, but has been involved in interreligious learning as her medium, both personal and professional. We now have centers for the study of Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and South Asian religious traditions at the GTU, and this makes interreligious conversations not only possible, but necessary and inevitable, and of course very exciting. 
Judith's interest in interreligious dialogue fo follows directly from her work in Chinese religious studies. But unlike many other scholars, whose emphasis is not on dialogue per se, or on the dialogue of ideas, but on learning from and with other religious traditions. This approach is expressed in her book, Understanding Other Religious Worlds, which has already been mentioned several times in this conference, and I won't go into that book uh, anymore here. But one can see in this book, Judith's own involvement and experience with theological education and religious studies in the North American context and beyond. She develops a learning process that seems, at least to me, easy to understand, but very difficult to put into practice. She speaks of six different stages of inter-religious learning, and because of time considerations, I'm not going to go into all of those here, but you can find this on page 47 of the book. <laughs> Her focus throughout this book is on the learners and their experience, but not at the expense of the beliefs and experiences of other religious worlds. She has a deep and nuanced approach to the importance of religious and cultural difference in the study of religion. We can see how, in this book, uh, Judith's interests have been shaped by her own teaching at the GTU. It's not a book of advocacy, but rather a guide to, to doing what we are trying to do interreligiously. You can see how her vocabulary uh, uh, that is developed throughout this book, and uh, I remember uh, uh, Munir mentioned this morning of these different words associated with the GTU and also associated with Judith. You can see how the vocabulary used here um, is related to the GTU, and it's a matter of the chicken and the egg a little bit about which one of these came first. Judith takes very seriously the task of interreligious learning and understanding in light of the serious challenges we face today. So much of uh, politics and international relations are bound up religion with religion, and so it's the responsibility of the GTU and other religious institutions to try to take up this task. In a more recent essay, uh, she emphasizes the need for multi-faith and multicultural multi group collaboration in engaging and presenting primary writers as an approach to teaching and to learning. She sees uh, this as both a pedagogical and practical necessity. And again, this is reflected in, the, in the, even the conference theme. It's a process in which she express, expects a great deal of the students. In other words, she wants us to mix with one another to seriously engage religious texts and interreligious problems. Judith's emphasis has always been on religious communities of interpretation, not on religious traditions or religious ideas, although these are not neglected. That's just, just not been, been her particular focus. Hers is an approach much more oriented toward a living dialogue and critical engagement among people, rather than a dialogue of ungrounded or philosophical ideas. That said, this presents us with at least two difficulties, neither one of which can easily be resolved. And these difficulties, I think, are, are formulate our own task for the future. The first is that it would require a very high level of commitment and expertise among those who become involved in interreligious learning especially the teachers. It will take, I believe, a continuing commitment on the part of educators and their institutions to develop uh, opportunities for their own interreligious learning, learning. For younger scholars, this will involve the learning of both non-Western and Western languages, both ancient and modern languages, sabbatical time for pilgrimages in other religious worlds, and serious study of religious texts traditions and communities other than one's own. Can our GTU seminaries commit to this? Specifically, in a world of declining resources and funding for theological education, how could this be possible? This is a real question for me, not simply a rhetorical one. A second difficulty involves the type of Christianity, uh, Judaism, Buddhism, or Islam that we are talking about. Speaking only of Christians, interreligious learning requires a disposition to dialogue and engagement with the other that is lacking in many Christian communities. For those who regard themselves as liberal, progressive, or Catholic, there is an openness to this kind of engagement. 
but Christians from conservative and evangelical traditions may not generally welcome an approach to theological education that includes interreligious learning. Um, I assume there will be a similar reluctance on the part of uh, believers from other religious traditions. It is not enough to say that we do not have many conservatives at the GTU. At least we didn't have many when I was here. Uh, for we're open to all. Berkeley is not the world. In my own context, uh, one that is much more interreligious than the United States, we have very little commitment to interreligious learning, especially in the churches, the seminaries, or even the universities. I mention this here as a difficulty, but it's not a uh, but it's also a challenge for us to try to overcome this difficulty. And I'm going to return to this in a slightly different way at the end of my talk. Third area is interdisciplinary studies in theology and religious studies, and the whole dialogue that has to go on between theology and religious studies, both at the GTU and in member seminary. This uh, area has already been suggested in the panel this morning and this afternoon, um, mean, namely this necessity of an interdisciplinary approach. Judith has led the way, especially in her work in the IDS seminar uh, for doctoral students. Many of you here have taken the seminar which Judith co-teaches with colleagues, including myself. Speaking as a co-teacher, I learned from this experience as much as I taught, and others have said the same thing here, but I also spent significant hours with advisees, something that is not the general experience of doctoral programs elsewhere. This personal approach to learning and spending time with students um, is something that should never become negotiable at the GTU. And uh, it's something that many of your former students have already spoken of, but it's a very important part of sort of seeing through what's involved in interdisciplinarity and in the projects that students are involved in. Judith has not yet written a book on interdisciplinarity. I could cite the other books written, but I think I speak for us all when I say, when I say that express the hope that this is part of your future. In the meantime, we all have our PDF files from courses which distill much of the work that she has done. The whole concept of an academic discipline is based upon a European approach to study and learning. The disciplines were reclassed and refined during the Enlightenment, and they became the foundation of Western learning, but also were exported to all areas of the world so that their foundation of university life and seminary curriculum in uh, all over the place. Whether we recognize it or not, we are all children of the Enlightenment in some sense, and this is not a bad thing. I am probably among a very few in this room who find value in the so-called Enlightenment project, but that's a subject for a different time. Our world situation has now changed, and a, dis a disciplinary approach to scholarship becomes increasingly problematic and confining. Uh, the uh, most universities and institutions of religious studies continue to be organized disciplinarily but there are increasing conversations and collaborations among the various scholars, disciplines, and this makes for an interesting time to be involved in teaching and learning. As I've tried to show, and as many of the other speakers have indicated, Judith's learning and teaching have been interdisciplinary from the beginning. This has also been an approach, the approach of many of us in our own areas of scholarship, so much so that it now seems the most natural way of doing things. Judith's work on Lin Chao En and her, advo and her advocacy of interreligious learning were interdisciplinary in themselves. As she once wrote, her own fields are Chinese studies, feminist studies, religious studies, and interreligious learning. I think she's maybe being too modest because I could add a few to this as well, but we'll leave that. That's, that's, that those are her words. The latter, especially interreligious learning, has given her an appreciation of difference. And uh, this is also part of the GTU difference and one of the distinctive things that we have to offer. You have to take the seminar, which will be, still be offered at the GTU to fully understand our approach to, it's still gonna be offered, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, to, to interdisciplinary and difference. I wanted to check that out and have it publicly recognized. Uh, but I cannot resist a very brief discussion of the structural models of interdisciplinarity 
that have become famous among her students and colleagues. And I'm just going to list these, and, and maybe I'm using out-of-date materials, so there may be more. But uh, the uh, one, the discipline of orientation, the home discipline. Uh, the second, the balance model, two disciplines equally used. Uh, what do we hear? Social ethics and biblical studies. The interstitial model, or working between the boundaries of disciplines. Emerging, the uh, emerging conversation model, the so-called Paris Cafe. The problem-based model, the frame model, the weaving model, and the thematic overlapping model. Okay, you can read about all of these things, and uh, I, I don't have time to discuss them. I'm sure they're not just eight models, and I've had at least uh, uh, one student who developed yet another model, and I'm sure many, many others like this. Um, but the models give an idea of how work in theology and religious studies can be constructed in an interdisciplinary way. The MDiv degree that's offered at many of our seminaries here is among the last of the generalist degrees. We used to speak of Frederick Schleiermacher's four areas of theological study, the Bible, history, theology, and practical theology. Most theological seminaries have already moved beyond these, but even if they have not, we can see that theological studies itself will involve conversation among the disciplines and a certain degree of interdisciplinarity. This same can be said for religious studies, which makes use of textual work, religious thought, history, anthropology, psychology, and other disciplines. And the dialogue between these two, theology and religious studies, GTU member seminaries and the GTU itself, is something crucial. And again, something that's unique in the world of religious studies and theological education. Now, most of us begin with some kind of home discipline. But we quickly move beyond to the second model. The interstitial model is favored among the postmoderns and those who are uncomfortable with the idea of any discipline at all. We all like the Paris Cafe model, as much as for the lifestyle it suggests, <laughs> uh, as for the very serious approach to conversations taking place at the different tables. The problem-based model is well suited to seeking practical, real-life solutions in ministry and church work. The frame and thematic models help us approach their subjects from different perspectives. My personal uh, favorite is the weaving model, not only because it relates to my interest in Turkmen carpets, their color, their texture, their irregularity, their depth, but because I believe that it most fully integrates the scholarly disciplines one has chosen. Judith wants her st uh, students and wants her colleagues to find their own scholarly voices and engage in collaborative conversations with one another. This makes for a dynamic way of organizing seminars and classes, and it highlights the importance of speech, not language, in academic exchanges. With Judith, students and colleagues carry on extended collaborative conversations, even over many years, and in my case, even over thousands of miles. When I was in graduate school, I became interested in the work of Eugen Rosenstock Husey, a German polymath, polymath who was also involved in many disciplines. I think he's the only person that ever was accredited to teach in five different graduate departments at Harvard. He too emphasized speech in his work, and he chose as his motto, motto respondio etsi mutabor, I respond although I will be changed. I think this could also be Judith's model. Motto. In the last paragraph of his great book, Out of Revolution, the Autograph, Autobiography of Western Man, published in English uh, in the 1960s, he wrote the following. And note that this was before the age of inclusive language, and I'm leaving the text as it was. Rosenstock. My generation has survived social death in all of its variations, and I have survived decades of study and learning in the scholastic and academic sciences. Every one of their venerable scholars mistook me for the intellectual type which he most despised. The atheists wanted me to disappear into divinity, the theologians into sociology, the sociologists into history, the historians into journalism, the, journalism, the journalists into metaphysics, the philosophers in, into law, and need I say it, the lawyers into hell, <laughs> which as a member of, my present, of this present world, I have never left. 
For, no, for nobody leaves hell all by himself without going mad. Society is a hell as long as a man or a woman is alone. And the, and the human soul dies from consumption in the hell of social catastrophe, unless it makes common cause with others in the community that common sense rebuilds after the earthquake upon the ashes on the slope of Vesuvius. The red wine of life tastes better than anywhere else. And a man or a woman writes a book, even as he stretches out his hand, so that he may find himself not alone in the survival of humankind. Rather heavy, as only a German of a certain age and with a certain disposition can be. But the quote is at the same time deeply moving and even humorous, for it shows how interdisciplinarity was treated in the academy, in Rosenstock's case at Harvard and Dartmouth, before the 1970s. We have moved a long way since then, at least I think we have, and Judith uh, has helped point it out the way. Incidentally, Rosenstock's most uh, accessible book is called I Am an Impure Thinker, in which we find this line, I am an impure thinker. I am hurt, swayed, shaken, elated, disillusioned, shocked, comforted, and I have to transmit my mental experiences lest I die. He has this preoccupation <laughs> of writing and death. Um, Judith has been a pioneer in interdisciplinarity, intercultural and inter, inter religious theological studies. I've tried to indicate some of the areas in her work that we will be able to draw upon for the future. Uh, you can, I'm sure, find many more. All students and colleagues who have learned from Judith will help to carry on her work in their own ways. But remember, she will also continue to carry on our work. And this is part of what it means to be involved in collaborative conversation. That said, I'm not particularly sanguine about the prospects for theological education in North America or elsewhere, or the possibility of interreligious learning in theological studies, as important as I believe this is. I am unsure how religious pluralism will be incorporated into theological education, or whether interreligious learning will be incorporated at all. It would be interesting to see how many of our seminaries uh, and I'm speaking in ignorance here, we have a kind of inter-religious requirement in the, for the preparation uh, for ministry. Um, I teach in Hong Kong and I regularly lecture and attend conferences in mainland China. I have found very little interest in inter-religious learning in theological seminaries or in Chinese universities and social science academies. Of course, following Judith, I try to find ways of changing that and I think I can record some successes. But there is a divide between religious studies and theological education in Asian institutions, and especially in China, and one needs to acknowledge and respect that divide uh, because this is a different context. There's also a divide here in North America, and that's something that uh, very few uh, theological seminaries are willing to address. Whenever I return to the GTU, I always find that we tend to exaggerate the virtues of the People's Republic of Berkeley on America's left coast. We sometimes speak as if our GTU approach is the wave of the future, which in time will be accepted all over. Those of us who work in other contexts quickly learn this is not the case. Yes, the GTU is a very special place, but so are other contexts and other places. Uh, maybe the GTU is missing out on some things. Um, for example, the formative role uh, and conservative role of traditional and historical memory. In other contexts, and here I speak not only for myself, but for many of my former doctoral students, especially for those working in Asia, we learn to adjust and adapt, and we don't lose hope. We discover new things, we translate what we have learned here, so that what we offer can be received and appropriated often in ways that we never would have imagined and maybe never would have wanted. The GTU has much to offer, but maybe there should be a bit more learning from other contexts that are not quite so cutting edge. And I'm using cutting edge in quotes there. Um, because our insights are so very important, we need to learn to have collaborative conversation with those who are not at the same starting point. We seek a more perfect union of graduate theological education and we recognize 
that uh, my devoted friend and colleague, Professor Judith Burling, uh, has made great contributions to this. In so many ways, she has helped us, both here at the GTU and in other places, discover our own voices and embrace religious pluralism in theological education and religious studies. Because of Judith's contribution, we can continue to move forward, even if the task is, head, is daunting, and even if Judith, upon retirement, will no longer lead the way. But we'll still count on you. I could not end this lecture without recognizing the importance of Rhoda Bunnell in sustaining Judith on this journey. For those of us who are fortunate uh, to have known uh, Judith's partner, our lives were enriched by her presence. Rhoda was a wonderful person, and we came to love her. She always cut to the heart of things. Um, she didn't often use nuance in so doing. <laughs> and uh, more than once, I've been put on the spot. But her disarming wit and keen insight into the human condition helped us in so many ways. Judith, you enhanced one another, and Rhoda blessed us all in the time we were given to be with her. The future beckons. We will need to introduce what we have done in theological education and religious pluralism to the situations in which we now find ourselves. We know that this will not be an easy task. Each new job, each new project, each new book becomes an act of recreation, not of repetition. The conversations continue, the work goes on, and our hopes and dreams will never be extinguished. Judith, you helped us create a more perfect theological union, but it must be made more perfect still. Thank you. We have a few minutes for <clears throat> questions and comments. Um, the reception, and I'm going to go ahead and announce now where the reception is going to be. The reception at 5.30 will be in the ch uh, courtyard of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. You can find it on your map or uh, just follow the crowd if you don't know where that is. And um, so we need to finish in time for people to get there, but I don't think there's any reason we couldn't go five minutes over or something like that here. So um, Philip has said that he will uh, welcome questions, comments, and I think I'll just let you point to people as you see their uh, hands waving and Sammy is available to bring the mic to them. Thank you, that was so beautiful. Um, and I just feel as if I got to know Judith just in time for her to clear out of being my neighbor. So, um, I mean, I knew who she was, but I know a lot more now uh, and about you too. So I, I was struck by your uh, quoting of uh, Rosenstock Hussey at the very end, who I know, I, I think you probably know that in Jewish studies, he's an important figure sort of from the other direction. Right, he right. was the interlocutor of uh, Franz Rosenzweig, right. and, who was his cousin also. And Rosenzweig and Rosenstock, I don't know how they got those two <laughs> names. Um, and I think, was he, didn't his wife, Gritti, also have yes, an affair wife, with he, Rosenzweig? He, he combined, yeah. So um, this is just the gossip part of my <laughs> question. So um, uh, I. I know that they had a conversation in 1913. They stayed up all night, and Rosenzweig was on the verge of converting to Christianity based on it. this charismatic uh, cousin of his, and then decided not to, um, and became, you know, probably the most important Jewish philosopher of the 20th century. So there is a question, question here, and my question is that I am very familiar with this notion of, of Sprachdenken, speech thinking, which uh, Judith is such an important proponent of. And my impression, it's obviously very appropriate that, that there should be two philosophers who come up with the idea of Sprachdenken, which is the, the basic idea that no thought 
is real or grounded or, or uh, useful unless it comes out of living speech. And I'm just wondering how it is that I always heard that Rosenzweig, that was Rosenzweig's big idea, and I just heard from you that it's Rosenstock's big idea. Hmm. So how exactly did this idea come into being and uh, of maybe leaving aside the question of credit, is there a, a, a Jewish version of it versus a Christian version of it versus a, is it just a cousin thing? Anyway, that's my, that's oh, there you are. Yeah, you can actually take a nap while I ask my question. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, <laughs> Naomi. And, and the answer that I would like to give, and that may be true, is that this uh, emerged out of their own conversations together. Uh, the Rosenstock's book, Speech and Reality, which came out after he moved to the United States, is the fullest uh, development of this in his own thinking. But, uh, you know, all along the way, he's keeping to emphasize speech. And if you listen to his lectures, which you can still get on tape from Dartmouth, you know, you can see the way in which, you know, he's a, you know, very, uh, you know, German, academically grounded, but he, wa he, he was questioning that all of the time because of the way in which um, how we speak with one another actually changes what we're going to say. Uh, but that would be a great, great project to look at the two of them together and how they, 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 they viewed speech. Thank you. Yeah, to continue with the same theme for those who were not in the morning, I'm Francis Vincent. Uh, I'm here for sabbatical semester here, teaching in Rome, the Salesian University. Well, I uh, just continue with the same theme, but from the linguistic point of view, you mentioned a number of times interdisciplinary research and interreligious uh, research, intercultural research always implies more than one language. Now, in the GTU or mm. in the research program, how much language is taken seriously? I, I was told that she learned, uh, I mean, Chinese and so on, to enter into the text, okay. And maybe that was the thing that opened up the mind, no? Now, in the doctoral program here, how much you encourage other languages? I think here, you have English as a facilitating language, or only language in which you do everything, uh, from research to living. But uh, learning other languages in the, at the age of, uh, at the stage of research, would yeah. it make more sense, and yeah. would it make interdisciplinary research yeah. more worthwhile? Yeah. yeah, that's again a very good question. You know, the Europeans, uh, uh, like to tell a joke, what do you call a person who's trilingual, or who speaks three languages, trilingual? What do you call a person that speaks two languages, bilingual? What do you call a person that speaks one language, American? And I think this is one of the deficiencies of, of being a great power where, inter, in, where English is the kind of national language. But speaking uh, uh, other languages and working in other languages uh, inevitably leads to changes in the way that you perceive things. I no longer write my books, whether in Chinese or English, primarily for a Western audience. I used to, but I think that it's, there's, there's other ways of addressing different concerns, and then you change your language in the process of doing that. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not saying I don't write for the Western audience, but I'm saying that's not my, no longer my primary, tar primary target. Um, and to do that, to be sensitive to that, or not to be sensitive, to, I, I, I don't like to overuse that word sensitive. To, to, to be effective in that way, you have to uh, um, change often the way you're speaking about uh, familiar things or things that would be familiar in one context and not in another. And by reading the texts, and I want to say here both ancient texts and, and, and modern texts, it gives you a new insight into the type of things that Judith was doing in her dissertation with Lin Zhao En. Uh, in, 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 in finding, um, uh, in, in rediscovering ideas uh, or in learning ideas that you never knew existed. 
Uh, and I think that's, uh, so that language then becomes uh, um, and should become an important uh, factor also in theological education. I tried to introduce a language requirement at my own school that everyone be required to learn a second language and they said no, no, nobody was going to apply to our school if that was going to be the case. So. Okay, back there. The GCU doctoral program requires two languages in addition to your native language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's someone back there. Uh, Perhaps the majority of people who are religious in the world are what we might call fundamentalists of one kind or another. So I guess my question is, what can we learn from fundamentalists? Yeah, I wasn't speaking necessarily in learning from fundamentalists. I was speaking about learning from people that are more conservative from the point of view that we have to talk about. And, and one thing that we, I mean, from fundamentalists, um, um, I think that study probably, what was it, Chicago University on uh, fundamentalisms, uh, that's now 30 years old, but that was an attempt to analyze this whole phenomena across the religious spectrum. But, um, you know, most of the, the Christians that I deal with are a lot more conservative than what you find around the GTU. And you define, and when, one of the things that I discover in that is the importance of their own uh, uh, textual tradition, in this case, Chinese textual traditions, um, in, and, uh, in, in, uh, and the way in which, uh, in an unrecognized way often, that has, sh has shaped their approach to scriptures and texts, their devotion uh, to the Bible. My, I have many, many books, many thousands of books, like we all do, and the most precious book I have is a New Testament which was copied by hand in 1967 in China. So that kind of commitment, that kind of devotion, I think has something to offer uh, to um, an increasingly biblically illiterate uh, society. And certainly that's not true of, 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 of the GTU or our theological seminaries, but the same kind of uh, understanding of textual traditions can no longer be taken for granted as it was 20, 30 years ago. But I don't want to mistake conservatives with fundamental. I'm not equating the two here. Excuse me. How? Um, so how is? So in some ways, there's a uh, an openness to other cultures that uh, characterizes progressives. But isn't there a kind of line between openness to other cultures and evangelical or missionary impulses that, I mean, I know the yeah. people who come at me with love in their eyes are often the missionaries. Right. No, I, there, there is a, there, there's certainly a, a, a divide there. And that, and, but that very kind of, uh, in the case of Protestant Christianity in East Asia, that that has spread and infected or, 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 or shaped the churches in uh, every country in East Asia. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sort of, I'm, I'm, you know, that's a fact. That, that you can see very, very clearly in, in what's happening. But given that that's a diff different kind of starting point, how do we begin to engage in collaborative conversation uh, with them? The openness that, that we have, and, and, and I think something that has developed uh, uh, primarily uh, from, the, from the history of the Enlightenment, the openness that we have uh, sometimes becomes uh, what a kind of everything goes and nothing matters kind of openness. Um, and, and I think that that's problematic for theological education. In the back, is it Munir? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Wickery. I really appreciated um, your presentation. Uh, just to maybe lift up this conversation or extend it a little bit, um, I would also argue that one of the things, um, 
well, at least how I interpreted the last part of what you're saying is um, to expand that conversation, I would add that we also need to look at what I mentioned earlier, which are secular fundamentalisms right. um, and secular exclusions and secular dogmas um, that exclude uh, different religions uh, as well. So I think part of the conversation has to be yes, meet religious actors and religiously committed people where they're at and um, and we're not at all at the same place because we're products of different histories and different times and different spaces. Um, some of our traditions have been historically excluded in one part of the world and, and you know, so we don't all expect to be at the same place in our traditions, but we certainly are able to have conversations. So I would say that part of those conversations have to include other kinds of dogmas that we that go unquestioned. Um, secular dogmas that we live out every day come appear to us as the norm, uh, right? And they don't seem to scare us, and, and they should. Uh, the kind of secular fundamentalisms or the things that are the kind of bloodshed that's done in the name of secularism. Um, so I think that that's, that's something we want to consider in, in, in these conversations. So, Philip, uh, you um, highlighted the fact that Judith has, has had really very profound uh, insights into and contributions to interdisciplinarity as well as uh, religious pluralism. And I think that um, there may be some, some wise patterns in the way that she deals with both of them. And I'm wondering if if in f f getting greater familiarity with her work, if you saw uh, profound areas of overlap that might be some of um, the wisest of, of Judith's contributions. The overlap between a commitment to interdisciplinarity and religious pluralism. Yeah, bo both her, yeah. her approach to interdisciplinarity yeah. and her approach to yeah. religious pluralism. Be because in, this, in the study of uh, of other religions in the West. I mean, it used to be done in a very different way, and maybe there were still remnants of this uh, when Judith and I were in universities, that, namely that uh, you know, you're focusing on ancient texts and you're not looking at real living religious traditions. And once you expand that, I mean, the texts are, are, are very, very important, but when you're looking at living embodiments, living expressions of things, you're not simply, it's, it's not here now just applying a, methodo an in, a multidisciplinary methodology, but you're seeing the multifaceted way in which religions themselves, within themselves, um, either in their lived expression or in, 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 in their study, uh, necessitate different ways of, of, of seeing, different ways of listening, different ways of hearing. So I think the two naturally go together. I mean, the, you know, your question, uh, I probably should, should, should think more about this uh, because it almost seems that any, an approach to uh, religious pluralism is necessarily inter-religious. Inter Not an approach to the study of religion, but an approach to religious pluralism. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Philip, for continuing this conversation for engaging the early Judith, the recent Judith, and the Judith that is to come. Uh, <laughs> the once and future Judith, I guess we should say. Um, and in highlighting the ways in which the work that she has done uh, has not only affected all of us so much, but has provided both inspiration and opportunity for us to carry that forward. Thank you very much. So we now have 17 minutes before the reception begins at uh, the courtyard at uh, CDSP, and then dinner will be served in the refectory at CDSP. Um, at 6.30. So we'll see you there.